Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 2021 edition of the State of the Union organized by the European University Institute. My name is Simone Borghesi. I'm the director of FSR Climate, the research group on climate change at the European University Institute. And I'm delighted to introduce this session today on EU, China, and US on their way to climate neutrality. This event is organized by FSR Climate in collaboration with the Policy Outreach Committee of the European Association of Environmental Resource Economists, the School of Transnational Governance at UI, and also under the LIFE DCHET project, where DCHET stands for Deepening International Cooperation on Emissions Trading. It's the LIFE project that I direct with my team here at UI. Joining us for today's discussion are Susie Kerr from the Environmental Defense Fund. Hi, Susie. Duan Maosheng from the Tsinghua University. Hi, Duan. And Vicky Pollard from the European Commission. Hi, Vicky. And in addition, I have the pleasure to have with me Joseph Becke, former uh, uh, director of DG Climate, uh, chairman of the Policy Outreach Committee of EAIRI and colleague at a European University Institute. Hi, Jos. He Hi. will moderate the event uh, with me. As you all know, several countries are increasing their ambition and aiming at climate neutrality by 2050 or by 2060, as in the case of China. We have just started a long, I would say, ambitious journey towards climate neutrality. But it's a long way, and I think we need to proceed fast and possibly together. Fast because the window of opportunities to reach the Paris Agreement target is closing rapidly. And together, because climate change is a global problem, so it requires coordinated action. And this applies in particular to EU, US, and China, which are the three big players in the climate arena. So the, there are stops and targets on the way to climate neutrality. And I think the first stop will be COP26, the first occasion to evaluate whether we are proceeding uh, in the same direction, whether as in the question that we pose for this event, our paths will converge or diverge. So to discuss this issue, we prepare some, some interesting questions with, with Joss. And I would like to pass on to Joss. Joss, do you want to present our speakers and then we start with our questions. Thank you, Simone. And it is really my pleasure to uh, introduce our outstanding panel. Uh, all uh, colleagues with whom I had the pleasure to work uh, with in the past. Uh, Susie Kerr from the United States. Uh, she is the chief economist at the Environmental Defense Fund. I worked with Susie when she was in New Zealand as head of and founder of Motu Research. And uh, it's a real uh, pleasure to have you on the panel, Susie. Um, I have Duan Maosheng, uh, with whom I also worked in the past, you know, setting up the ETS in uh, China. Duan Maosheng is professor and director of the China Carbon Market Center uh, of Tsinghua University. And, uh, you know, needless to say that Duan has been a pillar in the buildup of the ETS in China. And last but not least, uh, Vicky Pollard, uh, with whom I also worked <laughs> for a long time in the past. Uh, she is actually deputy head of unit in the unit dealing with the economics and the strategy of uh, climate uh, strategy and climate action. And um, Vivi, uh, Vicky was uh, formerly based on several uh, positions, but in particular in China, where uh, I think Vicky was very helpful in coordinating the European effort towards the, um, the um, uh, Chinese uh, counterparts, in particular on carbon markets. So uh, a very rich panel and uh, very honored to, uh, to be one of those asking you questions. And my first question would be, uh, now we have seen and heard from the United States that they are back at the table uh, since the 22nd of April. And that is a real relief to the European Union and also to China 
I would assume with whom we have been keeping up, you know, uh, intensive action under the Paris Agreement. Now it's time to converge. And we have heard a lot about targets, but the real issue is about policies. Um, targets are not being delivered on their own. Policies are reducing the emissions. And um, I would like to put forward a question um, and in the uh, order of where I would like to have a reply is to Susie, to Duan and to Vicky. Is there is a perspective of cooperating uh, between the EU, the US and China on several policies? And if I may add one policy that is on the table um, and that is attention that is creating a lot of attention in the European Union, it is about trade issues. Because you know, the carbon price in Europe is high, 50 euros per ton of CO2, and is expected to increase even further. So carbon leakage, competitiveness pressures are increasing. And I hope that is not going to stand in the way of a good cooperation between the US, uh, China, and the EU. So that's the first question. You know, where can we cooperate on policies and in the back of our mind is always the trading question because we are trading so much with one another. So if I may address to you, Susie, first, you are a privileged observer of the United States scene. Uh, your take on this, and then we move to Juan and then to Vicky. Yes. Um, so the decarbonization challenges we all face are multifaceted and the solutions need to be also so all countries will need to use a mix of policies, government leadership, support for innovation, infrastructure, pricing, uh, as the EU uses so strongly, regulatory change, community support, and, and others. The mixture will vary depending on needs, institutions, and culture. I think the key issue for the question that Joss is talking about is the intensity of that regulation. And pricing is one measure of that intensity. But, but many of those other policy instruments uh, will have large effects too. It makes it very difficult to compare the intensity across countries. So we just need to look at, at the levels of ambition and, and continue to try to assess that. What matters most in the policy mix is that those policies are credible, that they're effective, and that they are ambitious. Uh, policy divergence can be helpful, uh, though, across the international process for a few key reasons. So first, experimentation is useful as long as we evaluate. Sometimes we should have divergent policies because we really still don't know when what the best approach actually is and we can learn more from each other. Second, all the three countries are now converging on the final goal for domestic emissions, net zero in the middle of the century but different countries will be able to reduce emissions within their own borders effectively at different speeds because they have different emissions profiles and they've got very different contexts. That doesn't mean that they can necessarily have different ambition. And none of us are going fast enough yet. Faster decarbonisation domestically is still better. And it's really great that the EU has been taking the lead and in China as well. Third, Decarbonisation within each country is critical, but the ability to reduce locally should not be a constraint on a country or a region's total contribution to global climate stabilisation. And countries will take different approaches to helping others as well. The three regions we're talking about today have very different international levers to help that global transition. Part of that is demonstrating their own ambition, but also there are public finance approaches, such as Germany's efforts in Colombia, just small examples, the greening of China's Belt and Road Initiative. And as one example, the United States involvement in the new LEAF coalition of governments and companies to reduce deforestation effectively. But alignment is also useful. Where can countries usefully align? So three key areas. First, national level monitoring of emissions and tracking of effort, because to get cooperation among countries, greater transparency around our true mitigation efforts really helps build the trust and mutual confidence that will enable enhanced ambition and confidence about those trade effects that so many are concerned about. Second, 
Where there are global economies of scale and developing and implementing solutions, there's a real value to working together. So one example of that might be the electrification of trucks. And third, it's critical to coordinate when one country's actions can actively undermine other efforts. So aligning on the quality of international credits that countries use for compliance with ambitious domestic targets could completely shape the international carbon market so that it becomes an effective way to transfer resources to help developing countries as they accelerate their transition to flourishing low emissions economies, or it could disable that market. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Susie. Uh, a very comprehensive list of issues on which uh, we can work together indeed, and we would look uh, forward to that. Do one, um, China, you know, is rolling out this carbon market, and uh, we heard your president at the uh, uh, Biden summit, as we call it, uh, uh, in April uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago. So your take on where we could uh, cooperate. You have the microphone. Yes, uh, thank you, Joseph, for, for, your, for your question. I think, I mean, the, the three main players have uh, all announced their uh, long-term mitigation uh, target. And I think now we need to develop a specific uh, policies to achieve that uh, target. I mean, uh, for sure, I mean, each player have uh, its own specific situations. I don't think uh, we can uh, simply copy and paste the policies that are suitable in another, in another country or, or region. But I mean, you, you know, China was were, were called a planned economy for, for quite a long time in the past. So, but now you, 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 you say that, well, we are shifting from a command control uh, approach to, uh, to market-based approach. So we, our national carbon market will be, uh, I mean, the, the first uh, compliance period has already started and the real transaction will start, uh, I think the current plans will start in June. So basically, I mean, you will see the real operation of our national carbon market in, 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 in two months, within two months. And uh, well, anyway, the, even the, uh, the scale of the carbon emissions of China's national carbon market is large enough. I think it's more than the annual emissions is more than uh, two, two, uh, 4 billion tons of CO2 uh, each year, although it's uh, quite large enough. But uh, we, we still think there are a lot of emissions not covered by by the, by the emission trading system, especially those small emitters. So I think in China now there are also uh, proposals or, or some, uh, some people are thinking that, well, maybe besides emission trading system, we should also have at the same time a carbon tax. I mean, in the past, the people were thinking that, well, maybe we can only have one policy. Either you have carbon tax or you have emission trading system. Now I think the, 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 the thoughts of experts and authorities are evolving, I think, uh, they, they, are, they, they think that well, those two policies can complement each other and can uh, exist at the same time. I think, I mean, that's a, that's a very late, latest uh, development. I think, I mean, we can, the three of us, I mean, we can cooperate on, on both emissions trading system and the carbon tax. I think it's a, it's a, it's a carbon, two carbon pricing uh, approaches. I think we can cooperate and try to align the, the design or align the, the, the prices. I think that's something we can, we, we can do. And I think uh, in, in, the, in the end, I mean, we, we will try to uh, have a, well, I think most people say we should have a level playing ground, right? And the, the, the prices will be one of the, one of the indicators for the, for, for the for level playing ground. I think we, that's something we can try to work together. Yeah, thank you, Joss. Thank you. Thank you, Juan, uh, for your interesting statement. And also, I see it in Europe, you know, the carbon tax debate alongside emissions trading is also back. But Vicky may tell us more on that. And Vicky has a particular perspective, as you know, the ins and outs of uh, international diplomacy, uh, you know, so, so well. The, the floor is yours, Vicky. Um, so I think um, that um, we're looking at a situation where everybody is now focused on um, climate neutrality. The EU has been looking at this for, um, for, for a little bit longer maybe than, than some of the other countries who've come up with targets um, more recently. I think what's very important and to pick up some of the elements that Susie mentioned is the very broad range of policies that we're, we are working on. Um, the, the, 
the transition is going to require um, all sectors to contribute and to contribute to getting to a situation where we are uh, pushing mitigation uh, to the extreme and um, moving towards uh, removals. Um, but I think at the core, still, we have this uh, issue, the, the question of carbon pricing, sending an economy wide signal, which is very important. We have the very long standing experience with the EU ETS. Um, and um, that, that has been uh, really fundamental in sending a long term signal, um, not though, only to those um, who are regulated, but also to others. And we're now in the process of looking at um, both strengthening the EU ETS, but expanding its coverage to other sectors. Um, so maritime, um, also the question of transport um, and, and heating. Um, so um, I think this is a very powerful tool and we now see that the prices in the EU are, are, uh, are rising. Uh, they've risen to uh, between 40 and 50 euros a ton. And so it's really focusing people's minds. But at the same time, we're looking also at the other elements of the package, in particular, the effort sharing, the targets to member states, but what that means in terms of what's done for the sectors outside the ETS, um, in particular, um, um, you know, other aspects around um, agriculture, um, but also the land use issues. And I think there's a lot of development at the moment in Europe around land use policy and also what, um, what it means to move towards removals. So there's policy work happening on a, um, um, how we certify emissions removals for the future. So we have this big package coming up um, in, in July, which will um, include all the legislation um, necessary to take us to the higher 2030 target, to put us on the path to climate neutrality. And as I said, within that, it's a mixture of the carbon pricing and other elements. And I think in the work that we're doing internationally, um, we've had a long-standing cooperation um, with North America, but in, and, and very much with China, with Duan Maosheng, with MEE, and previously with NDRC um, on all elements of, of ETS, what it means to put an emissions trading system in place in practice. I think that has really been important in terms of building trust. We, we know each other very well. We know um, why um, our systems differ in their design. It also helps us look to how we want to converge or where we can converge over time and where convergence is important. You know, what really matters in terms of convergence and where um, designs can be different. I think that trust in particular with China, which I know better than work with the US at the moment, is really also now feeding through into other areas of cooperation around analysis, um, the strategy setting, um, and I think elements of how you also look at uh, the governance that leads to um, uh, local authorities, provinces, uh, in our case, member states, uh, to, to meet their targets. Um, and I think that um, as we, we, we move forward, some of the areas around how to get a transition of the scale we're talking about in terms of the social and economic um, aspects will become more important because um, I think we've been very clear in Europe, uh, the transition only works if it's a, a just and a fair transition, if, if no one is left behind. And I think all the policies around how the revenues from an ETS are spent to support innovation, to support modernization, how those are combined with the funds coming from um, the green recovery, um, from next generation EU, the uh, recovery and resilience um, uh, funds, how those all work together to support the transition. And I think the lessons we're learning from that are also very important to share um, at, at, at the technical level, because that, um, we can all move faster to improving the process and improving the policies so that um, the transition happens on the ground. Um, so we're really moving to implementation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vicky. And I would like to shift uh, the floor to Simone, uh, who will take over for the next question. Thank you, Joss. Uh, thank you for these uh, this interesting answers that actually give me the opportunity to ask another answer that I have in mind, since we are all here around our virtual table. Uh, my question is, 
how likely is in your view the possibility of uh, having a climate club as uh, the terminology that is used today um, to uh, that, that encompasses EU, US and China. I had the opportunity to ask the same question to uh, uh, Nobel Prize because he was uh, giving a, a lecture at the Italian Association and you know that William Norhouse was the one or among the one who, who was promoting this idea. So I asked the question to, to the three of you, how likely is a climate club for the three of us? Susie first. Uh, so I think a club is, it's a very exclusive sounding thing. Sounds like something my mother would have been excluded from. Uh, if we're gonna truly get global cooperation, we have to have mutual trust and respect. I don't think we can force other countries to act on climate at the speed we need and certainly not in ways that allow them to thrive. And isn't helping people thrive what we're ultimately trying to do? So I wonder, I worry a little bit about the idea of, of exclusivity. But that said, we do need ways to build a positive spiral of cooperation and to put pressure on opportunistic countries that are lagging. And that's somewhere where these three countries working with others could really make a huge difference. So I think what would be very useful is a coalition that unites nations who are committed to high ambition, to transparency, and to the integrity of international credit transfers under Article 6. A coalition like that could co coordinate countries' efforts to exert regulatory pressure and to build new industries. It could build trust and improve transparency. It could share experience, and it can increase climate ambition by providing a very positive example for others. It could focus on implementation and creating irreversible facts on the ground and not just political commitments. It could also assure the quality of international credit are used to support developing countries accelerate their decarbonisation because we're not going to get there without them and they probably won't get there without us. One key challenge for the high quality crediting which a smaller group of countries could potentially take on, would be to develop principles and methodologies to define acceptable but different speeds of transition to net zero across countries that have very different socioeconomic contexts. Kenya should not be expected to move as fast as New Zealand. Harmonisation of some aspects of emissions trading system within a coalition like this could improve transparency because it would make the systems easier to compare. But personally, I don't think that having a, a, some sort of a club which has direct linkages among emissions trading systems are a top priority. The huge gains from trade that are available are between the North and the South, not among the countries of the North. Liquidity is nice, but it's a second order issue. And, and also, as New Zealand has found, linking markets that are created by governments is risky. It's like linking currencies. Thanks. Thank you, Susie. Uh, the question should have been, first of all, how desirable would be a club and then how likely. <laughs> and I would like to, to hear the view of, uh, of Duan on this and actually adding a little question uh, in the sense that can international cooperation and among emission trading system promote this coalition as Susie was correctly calling it? You know, Duan, we have been uh, discussing this for a while, uh, you, as you know, it's an interest of our life uh, project, the, the one we are doing now, but also the previous one in which you were involved. So I would like to hear your opinion uh, on this issue. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Simone. I think uh, the idea of a club was not something new. I think uh, it was proposed more than 10 years ago. And I think the, the, the key question is not whether it is feasible. I think the before we can answer that question, I think uh, we should ask uh, ourselves, I mean, what additional benefits can the, the club, uh, I mean, the, the serve? I think that, that's, a, that's a key question because now we have uh, various of, uh, platforms. We have the G20, we have the APAC. I mean, we have various forms. I think uh, then uh, with the additional of forum, I mean, I think uh, we, we need to ask ourselves I mean, what kind of, uh, additional benefits we, we can't get. I think that's, that's, that's a key question we, we should ask uh, ourselves. I mean, that's really related to the design or to the purpose 
of the of the of the club. And I mean, then uh, you asked about the uh, linking of emission treatment system. I think that's something that's a, that's a very specific uh, uh, effort. And that's something we can we can try to work together. I mean, because we are, if we are going to uh, try to try to uh, have a level uh, playing ground, if we are try to uh, try to be uh, at same uh, ambition, I think I mean that's something we we can do. And I think that's something much easier. And uh, also, I think there are a lot of analysis on the on the benefits of, of linking uh, different carbon pricing uh, mechanism. I think that's something really we can we can try to, to do in the in near future. But for the for the idea of the uh, club, I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I don't have an answer at this stage. <laughs> Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Duan. So I, I moved the same question to, to Vicky. Uh, with a little provocation, if I may, uh, in the sense, um, what is the uh, role of the European CBAM carbon border adjustment mechanism uh, in promoting or hindering this uh, this coalition? What's your okay, so maybe to start by saying, I think, like Susie and Juan, I think that the maybe I have more questions about what a carbon club really means. I think it depends a lot on the um, what is done, but I think de facto, when we're talking about US, uh, China, and Europe, it's about leadership, for example, and, and through and through the, the the targets, the ambition being set, but also the practical implementation measures. And I think for the EU, we you know we focus very much on climate diplomacy. We have a huge climate diplomacy effort. We're very present in terms of providing support in explaining what we do. Um, explaining why we do it um, and providing finance um, for for the uh, developing countries and support for capacity building and many many projects around the world to um, promote a broader understanding of policy a broader capacity um, and to build those bridges and I think that work is very very valuable it's very important um, because uh, in moving fast the more we can share about what we do well and what we don't do so well is, is, is very important. In terms um, of uh, linking and carbon markets, I think carbon markets are developed, um, the, the biggest carbon markets are being developed to um, meet domestic policy targets. So fundamentally they're, they're, they're designed to, um, to work within an ex uh, a, a, a particular system to meet um, very specific targets and I think that um, this is um, always an issue when we look to linking is the question of uh, aligning systems when you have different, very different systems, different levels of ambition, but also different, um, different sectors, different uh, issues of sovereignty. So I think um, ideas of carbon clubs um, where there is some devolution of sovereignty to a different uh, outside the jurisdiction. I mean, jurisdiction is always a little bit complicated. So um, I think that that's where there are limits. I think in terms of linking of uh, carbon markets, I agree with, 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 with Susie, it's not the immediate concern. I think thinking towards linking is useful because it does uh, help us think about um, how our carbon markets can work better together um, uh, and, and hopefully get towards that stage. But I think there is uh, still a long way to go. I mean, for example, in the cooperation with China, you know, China is just setting up the ETS um, in terms of its implementation. It's, it's beginning right now. And so I'm, I'm sure that the, um, the, the Duan and all the people he is working with in, in, in China are very focused on all the different aspects of how it's working and how to improve that. And, th and that work is tremendously important in, how, in terms of China reaching its targets. It's not a time to start distracting with, with lots of discussions with, with the Europeans or others about linking at this stage. It's, not, it's just not right, the right time. Um, it's important to see how the system works. But I think um, that um, it's important in terms of uh, um, um, having a positive relationship, a positive dynamic and a lot of trust. I think CBAM comes from a uh, concern in Europe that as we increase our ambition, um, we um, are, are really asking our companies to make a lot of effort to reach the 2030 targets and beyond 
It involves very large changes and very big um, investments. And what we don't want to see is that the emissions reductions in Europe lead to emissions in, uh, increases elsewhere. So I think this, I think is in, in terms of just um, global uh, climate, I think it's important. I think also, I think CBAM can be helpful. Um, and I think it is being helpful in terms of engaging the minds of decision makers outside um, those ministries dealing with climate um, in, in other parties. I and mean, we can see we're getting a lot of questions about CBAM. Um, in all sorts of settings, because uh, I think our climate colleagues are being asked to, to ask these questions by other ministries. And I think in, in as much as that can help raise um, the, the importance of um, uh, raising ambition and, and putting in place robust carbon policies, I think that's very important. But at the moment, of course, we're waiting for the proposal on CBAM and what exactly that will look like. So it's a bit early to say more, I think, on how CBAM will impact the relationship. Sure. Thank you, Vicky. I pass on to Joss. Yes, well, um, I would like to open the perspective towards COP26. You know, COP26 is around the corner and the Commission, as we just heard from Vicky, is going to come with a raft of proposals, uh, including on ETS, on uh, how to deal with emissions from the maritime sector, uh, renewables, energy efficiency, a whole raft of things, you know, eagerly awaited uh, by all those who are no longer in the Commission, if I speak for myself. So, um, but the question is COP26. Um, how, uh, and I will reverse the order of speakers, and I will start with Vicky and then go to Duan and then go to Susie. Um, um, COP26 and the raft of proposals that the, that the Commission is uh, preparing, um, one of the proposals that is going to create controversy is the CBAM proposal. Will it be helpful to have that on the table before COP26? Because I just chaired a panel uh, before this panel, and uh, we got a strong message, you know, for the EU not to rush ahead, but to open a consultation with trade partners, uh, if not in the COP uh, or in the UNFCCC context, then at least in the WTO context. Um, so the question is, is COP26, what is it going to deliver? And with all the goodwill that the Europeans are bringing on the table, is CBAM not going to spoil the fun? Uh, so, uh, Vicky, you know, uh, to you and then to Duan and then to, to Susie, because the least thing we want is, you know, quarreling on, a, on, 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 on stuff, but cooperating on stuff. And, and that is behind my entire question, Vicky. I think obviously um, the uh, announcement about increases ambition ahead of the COP have been very important. I think we're looking for um, other others to come forward with increasing the ambition in their NGCs, and that's tremendously important. And the um, the analysis that came out this week showing that uh, the impact of the new announcements in terms of um, in terms of temperature um, projections is. Um, I think emphasizes how important it is that we, we have ambitious action. So I think the fact that Europe has um, the climate neutrality targets, that we are, are working very seriously on the pathways, that we, we will be coming forward with a whole raft of proposals um, in July, CBAM being just a small part of it, but all the other legislative proposals about that show how the Commission proposes that we get to 2030, I think is, is, is tremendously important because that is what really matters. It's about moving now to implementation. Um, and of course, there are other important, <laughs> many other important issues to be dealt with at the COP, not least transparency and Article 6 and the rules um, in terms of international carbon markets. Um, but to come back, obviously, on, on CBAM, it's very difficult for me to say at the moment. Um, from my position in the Commission, um, what it will look like, because it's a proposal which is not being published yet. There has been a public consultation that is part of the um, better regulation process um, for all uh, Commission proposals. So there has already been um, a, a public consultation stage, which would have been taken into account by the colleagues um, involved in developing CBAM. Um, but I think that um, it's important, as you say, to focus on the positive cooperation and to understand why exactly 
the EU is putting in place this policy. Um, that it's um, we're very committed that this should be uh, completely in line with um, WTO, um, and this is about climate ambition. And I think um, then to focus on on the broader picture is is important. Thank you, thank you, Vicky. And uh, passing over to Duan and picking up some of the questions coming through uh, the, the, the the chat box from participants. Um, and Duan, um, you know, uh, we talk about the CBAM, about cooperation, but of course, behind our question from the European side is, how is the price forecast for the Chinese ETS, you know, going to evolve in your view over the next decade, because we are now passing the 50 euro uh, mark. Uh, so the gap is, is widening and the more China would do, the more it would facilitate the future discussion on the CBAM. And also the other element is in terms of cooperation are the specific elements on which apart from carbon markets, we could deepen our cooperation on. That's also a question to Susie uh, later. Um, you know, are there particular elements we could uh, dig out further? Duan, you have the floor. Yes, uh, I think for the uh, COP26, I mean, uh, Vicky has uh, elaborated well. I mean, we have some outstanding issues for the rule book and we need to fill that gap. And, uh, and as also uh, countries have raised uh, their ambition in the, in the past uh, months. Uh, and I think uh, now I think we need to consider uh, how we could uh, create a, a cooperative uh, uh, atmosphere for, for, for us to achieve that target. And I mean, basically, if you say uh, people, uh, parties raise their ambition, they also have additional requirement for, for, for financing and technology. I mean, that's something we need to, we need to uh, consider. On the, on the Chinese emissions trading system, first, I think we are going to uh, expand, uh, cover, uh, cover more sectors, uh, that's, that's clear. And, and with the new uh, 2030 and the 2060 uh, target, I think uh, the speed of uh, covering more sectors will be, will be uh, I think at the, at the time uh, will be uh, much shorter than, than what it, we expected. And I mean, I don't know how the, 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 the what, what the specific price will be, but I think the general trend is that well, the price will uh, definitely increase, not not decrease. I think the, the question, I think the, the the background is very clear. We have we have now the carbon emissions peak target, uh, we have the carbon neutrality target, uh, and I think that then the question is how what, what is the appropriate uh, uh, carbon price for us to to achieve that target, and uh, as the current press. Uh, uh, is a carbon price appropriate for us to achieve that? I mean, I think that's a question we are asking ourselves. And, and, and I think the, the answer of most people is that well, a very low carbon price. I mean, at the level of our pilot, uh, uh, the prices at our uh, pilot systems are not enough. We, we must have a, a higher price. I mean, I, but I don't think uh, we can uh, have a price comparable to the, to, the, to the European system in the near future. But I mean, I think that's 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 the direction we, we should work uh, work hard on, and uh, and also I mean it's a little bit related to the CBM. I mean, no matter people admit uh, or not, I think uh, this the proposal of the the CBM proposal will uh, to some extent uh, affect the design of China's national emissions trading uh, system. And uh, I mean, <laughs> I think that's something we 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 we, we cannot deny. And uh, but I think uh, we we need more uh, dialogue to see how uh, a phased approach, I mean, I don't know how, how that will look like, but I think we, we need some uh, phased approach to, to, to achieve a harmonized uh, carbon price. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you, thank you, Joanne, very helpful. And passing over to, to Susie, are there areas of cooperation that you see sticking out? And you mentioned when it comes to the CBAM, the implicit price that some measures uh, may have, and contrary to an explicit price that uh, those of us having uh, carbon markets uh, are uh, using for. Susie, over to you. So I hope that all countries can use COP26 as, as another opportunity to offer more ambition and to encourage others to increase their level of commitment. But it's also would be great if this COP could begin to really transition towards a focus on implementation as well as those high level political commitments, recognizing those who are actually achieving real reductions and, and as you say, Joss, who are actually uh, imposing high implicit or explicit prices on their economies and, and those who are not. 
and helping each other by sharing experience and, and resources. I agree that we could focus more on concrete ways to work together on specific sectoral issues. Uh, so one example is road transportation where everyone is struggling. And there may be an opportunity this year to learn from the extraordinary success uh, of cooperation on the science of vaccines. That could be a real inspiration, uh, but also we need to learn from the failures in cooperation around the distributions of vaccine and the terrible implications that that, that, that is having. It would be a shame, I think, if the focus of the uh, COP became very heavily on CBAM because that can be perceived as penalising countries, uh, penalising all countries. And so while it could provide some uh, good impetus to action by some of the laggards, it could also create some unhelpful conflict. And I'm particularly concerned, as you can probably tell, about supporting developing countries actively to accelerate their low emissions transition so they're not left behind at huge cost to them and to all of us. Because as we know, global net zero means global. And I hope that the COP can really make progress on this issue, which has been particularly challenging. As we know, in order to transform global economies at the pace and scale that science shows us is necessary to avoid climate disaster, it's not enough for countries, companies or regions to pursue their own climate solutions. Those of us who have financial, technical and expert resources must reach across borders to invest in the largest, fastest, most beneficial opportunities for near-term decarbonisation. And many of those are in developing and emerging economies. But it's fantastic that the EU, the US and China are making real efforts to transform their energy systems. And I hope that that just continues to accelerate. At some point, though, they will find realistically reduce emissions more rapidly domestically. The cost just gets too high and the EU may be getting close to that point at the moment. But as Franz Timmerman pointed out last week, we can go further now by providing climate finance and we need more climate finance. And poorer and richer countries, they really need to work together to find effective ways to use um, and provide financial and other resources. We need to be able to demonstrate that by working together, we can accelerate the transformation of even the poorest countries into flourishing low emissions economies. That's the recipe for success. Thanks, uh, Susie. And if I may fill that in as well, is uh, uh, in, into cooperation on technological issues, the way renewable energy storage, uh, I see from the uh, chat box coming, ideas about electric vehicles and other cooperation that we may have with other countries. Uh, so thanks very much for the input. I pass over to Simone uh, because uh, I'm afraid that uh, our time is getting very short now. Um, I, I'm bleeding on guilty, Simone, over to you. Thank you, but you give me the, the, the wrong and difficult part of the game because I see and you see the countdown. And so we are about to close in one minute and 40 seconds. Still, I would like to say that there are many comments coming. Uh, many of them stress the Biden role uh, in, in the game. For instance, I've seen uh, Phoebe Honduri from the Policy Outreach Committee underline that the Joe Biden's Climate Change Summit assembled the world leaders and the summit represented a tipping point. The world's largest economies are finally aligning around the goal of deep decarbonization. And also, there was a comment, or actually a question to Susie, asking, do you think the USA will make effective steps soon? How soon? Very difficult question in one minute and 10 seconds. But <laughs> Susie, if you want to try to address in, in a few seconds this point, and then we close. So I think the Biden administration is deeply committed to making real progress on this. And as all of you know, the US faces huge challenges. So one of them is the uh, social issues that uh, Vicky talked about so much. Um, and of course, there are, there are the very well understood political challenges. So I think they're gonna do their very best. I think they're very genuine. I think there's a lot of a lot of energy and enthusiasm and new ideas. A lot of very good people have gone into the administration. So I'm optimistic. Good. I, I see that uh, we are allowed for a few more seconds. Joss, do you want to? Well, yes, I have a question to Susie. Uh, Susie, you worked a lot in New Zealand on uh, land use uh, policies 
and forestry and agriculture in particular, you know, what kind of policy approaches would you think the world and in particular the EU and the United States and China can profit, uh, profit from these experiences that New Zealand was going through? So, yes, we've been working on this for a long time. I think we have learned a lot about uh, how you can use uh, price incentives in these sectors. And I think particularly for countries uh, like those in Europe and in the United States, developed countries, those are uh, options that really could be applied politically. They will be challenging. Uh, you're dealing with a lot of small farmers often. So the distributional issues are particularly acute. Um, but, but I think they, they can be resolved. And then beyond that, it's, it's about education. It's about technology change and, and getting those technologies out quickly. And, and of course, you know, with regard to ruminants um, and cows and, and sheep and things, it, it's also heavily about uh, changes in diets, which is just something will happen gradually. Well, thanks very much, Susie. But the European debate is much focused on the MRV question. Huh? Do we know exactly what kind of emissions are created or avoided through uh, this agriculture and forestry sectors? And we keep quarreling. We have a leftover of Kyoto. We are moving into measurement. You know, is New Zealand further down the road when it comes to clearing the sky on MRV questions? So New Zealand does have relatively good MRV, but I think the more important thing is that you don't have to get this perfect to be sending a useful signal. We know that zero price is the wrong price. So we, we're moving in the right direction. It doesn't have to be perfect and don't let perfection be the enemy of good. The critical thing is that it is, it is not biased. It's not something that the participants uh, in the system can influence themselves. So you're not creating perverse incentives, but, but there's lots of regulations that we do where we don't get it perfectly right, but, but we're still moving ahead. And this is one of those areas too. If I still can jump in with one quick question, Simone, coming over from the trade discussion we had this morning, um, the cooperation on fossil fuel subsidies and addressing the coal question. I became very prominent on the table. Now, we still have a coal problem in Europe, uh, but of course there are regions in the world, in particular Asia and China. Juan, if I may be, you know, amongst friends, you know, addressed to you, uh, the coal question was one of the issues we were hoping for a more, um, a more proactive comment from uh, your president when uh, we had the Biden summit. Uh, now, the, the, the five-year plan coming, is, is there hope that the question is under revision, um, you know, that uh, we, we may hope to have before COP26 a more proactive reply on that question? Well, I mean, uh, <laughs> I don't have an answer to that question, but I think uh, the, the challenge is very clear to us. I mean, coal is a, is a major energy uh, source for, for China. and. Uh, for us to, to achieve carbon peaking, to, for us to achieve uh, carbon neutrality, I mean, we must solve that problem. I think that's that's crystal clear. And I think now the, the, the at least the, the, the current plan is that our, our new, most of our new uh, increased uh, energy demand will come from renewable uh, non fossil fuel. I think uh, the current, uh, the current, the, uh, the energy administration, uh, administration now is, is seeing that one more than uh, 70, more than uh, three, uh, three quarters of the newly increased uh, energy will be coming from uh, non-fossil fuel. I think that's, that's the current state. And uh, with the increase of, I mean, I think in, in the future, I think the, all, all the, all the in, new, newly increased demand will come from non-fossil. I think that, that's clear. Thank you very much. Uh, from my side, I, I really found this a very interesting discussion. Uh, over to you, Simone. Well, Thank you, Jos. I think uh, we use also the extra time, so this time <laughs> is time to close. But uh, first of all, I would like to thank all the panelists because it was extremely enlightening, this, this discussion. Uh, and secondly, I would like to invite you, the audience, to keep following us uh, with the activity of FSR, SDG, of the uh, Policy Outreach Committee of the European Association, because we will have other uh, events like this uh, in the near future at our conference. And so with this, I would close and 
inviting you to stay tuned. And after the break, you will have more interesting events here at the State of the Union. Thank you all for watching. Thank you. Thank you, Vicky, Joanne, and Susie. Thank you very much. Bye.